part 5 of the engine rebuild and this part is going to be about putting the timing cover and also the oil pan back on the engine. Um, so I'm going to start off by the timing cover and while I'm installing the timing cover I'm also going to be replacing the timing chain, the oil pump chain and also all the timing chain guides and also all the rubbers and the o-rings that go on this timing cover. Um, and then later I'm going to get onto the oil pan and I'm also going to be making like one small change to the oil pump. I also finally decided what I'm going to do with this engine later so I'm planning to move the turbos to the front and possibly get rid of the supercharger but yeah I'll talk more about that at the end of the video. So I started off by assembling the front of the engine so I installed this sprocket that goes on the crankshaft and then I installed this guide wheel for the timing chain just be careful about this one the bolt that goes in for this is actually reverse threaded so you have to spin it counterclockwise to tighten it and the torque specification for this one is 58 Nm. After that I got to installing new timing chain guides, now three of them are fixed but one of them just goes on a pivot because that's the one that goes with the timing chain tensioner to um, put tension on the timing chain. Next I installed the oil pump chain tensioner, now this one is just a spring loaded tensioner and it just applies some force on the oil pump chain to finish any slack in it. Um, it doesn't work like the timing chain tensioner, the timing chain tensioner actually does have a connection with the car's oil pressure so it actually uses the oil pressure to open up and finish any slack in the main timing chain. Getting to the timing chain, I'm also installing a new timing chain and also a new oil pump chain. Comparing the length of the old and the new timing chain, the old chain had definitely stretched by just a little bit. The old chain is the one on the right and the new chain is the one on the left. And putting them side by side, you can see that the older one is just slightly longer than the newer one. The stretch is actually caused by like play in these individual links, so that like, these individual links keep wearing out and then they keep like uh, moving farther away from each other. I know that it will make like some difference in terms of timing because the engine timing like the valve timing would be slightly retarded the more the chain stretches. If the timing chain stretches beyond a certain limit there is a possibility that it can break but for this specific chain I don't think the stretch was that bad. I think the timing chain guides would have gone way before the timing chain itself anyways because the guides were already all starting to get cracked up. But anyways getting to how to install these timing chains, well first of all when you get these chains they come open ended so like they're not closed like right now it's a closed loop but when you actually buy them from the dealership they're actually open ended and you have to crimp one of these ends to actually close them. Uh, for installing the timing chain there, you have to follow this diagram over here, it, this is also in the service manual and it tells you the location of these copper lugs um, because you can see that a few of these um, links are actually copper and these have to go in like certain locations so one of them has to go over here, the other one has to go over here and the other two have to go on these timing chain sprockets They have to line up with these marks and when you line these up in these marks that's when your timing will be right. For lining the timing chain up properly first I had to bring the crank to a certain position. Now there's a key inserted on the crank and that key should be pointing straight upwards for that timing to be right. If you want to double check you can insert the hydraulic damper on the engine and just make sure that the 40 degree mark is pointing straight upwards. Now the engine should be upside down when you're installing the timing chain, that's one thing I screwed up on when I was removing the timing cover on my teardown video. So I took the timing cover off and everything just fell down, all the timing chain and the timing chain guides. Uh, that's because the engine was the right side up, the proper way to do it is to have the engine upside down when you're like installing the timing chain or uh, removing the timing cover or any of that. Because that's when everything just stays in place when you um, put it in. Once the timing chain was in place, next I had to install these timing chain sprockets. These are the ones that spin the camshafts. And then I put wire ties on the sprocket just to make sure that it stays on its proper timing marks. Here's how the timing chain goes on the engine. Just make sure that this copper thing is pointing straight upwards. Like it's just like the diagram says. Well, it's not exactly straight upwards. It's like slightly off to the side. Um, but it's also slightly off to the side in the diagram. So it's that link over there. And then make sure that these sprockets, like the left, the sprocket that goes on the left, you should be lining the mark that says L with the copper thing over here because both these sprockets are the exact same. They both have an R marking and an L marking on them. So make sure that whatever sprocket you're using on the left side, you follow the L and whatever sprocket you're using on the right side, you follow the R. After that I just put the oil pump chain in place for now and next I had to get to making some small changes to the oil pump. Getting to the oil pump and what I plan to do with it, so you might know um, about this oil pump that from a few videos back when I was taking this engine apart I mentioned that um, it had this hard rubber o-ring that seals uh, this oil pump to the collector tube and when these rubbers get hard like they start leaking and the oil pump starts sucking in air which causes a loss of oil pressure and uh, now the new o-ring that comes from the dealers, they actually have changed the design so the o-ring is not only thicker it also it's a different material. I tried asking the part guys like um, what is the actual difference like um, have they actually are updated the part number but the part numbers are the exact same of this o-ring and this o-ring um, but they clearly have updated the material and everything and hopefully it should last much longer than um, these old crappy ones that go hard and leak. The other thing I'm going to be changing on this oil pump is that 
Um, I'm also going to be like um, polishing this surface that goes inside where the o-ring seals to because if you look at the surface it's actually like a really bad casted surface so like um, the casting on this part is actually even worse than the casting on all the rest of the oil pump. Um, in fact this is like probably the most critical part of the oil pump where it actually has to seal in order to suck in oil from the oil pan. And well let me just see if I can show you a better like view of the casting. So yeah you can see the casting inside there it's actually a pretty rough casting and that's the part uh, around which this o-ring has to seal so you can see that like even if this o-ring like gets slightly hard or something it's definitely not going to have a perfect seal on like a surface that's that that's that rough for now the changes i'm going to be making to this oil pump is that i'm only going to be polishing this inside surface so i'm going to be polishing this part and i'm going to be using this new o-ring and hopefully this should last a lot longer and even if this fails i will have an oil pressure gauge and a warning light and possibly even an alarm and a cutoff system too so that if this o-ring fails or if anything else happens that causes an oil pressure loss hopefully that shouldn't cause the engine to blow or to like cause fine bearings for taking the pump apart there's just these three really long screws that are holding everything together once they're removed you can take it apart uh, the other thing i don't like about this pump is that the strainer is inside the pump that's actually something you'll see in most new york cars that the strainer would be inside the pump and the problem with these designs is that if the oil pump actually sucks in anything it wouldn't really be drained down by itself you'll actually have to take the pump apart to clean the strainer the section you see after the strainer that's just the pressure regulator so i think it regulates the maximum pressure of the pump up at around like 75 psi or something the two gear pumps you see after that, these are what form the main uh, stage of the pump, so they're what actually flows all the oil to your engine. And then that last stage that's still left inside the pump, that's for the scavenging stage, that's the stage that sucks oil from the uh, smaller pan at the front and then it like flows that oil to the pan at the back. After the pump was disassembled, I just polished up that surface using a Dremel where that o-ring sits. And then once everything was done, I was left with this um, nice polished surface, so hopefully it should be a much better surface for the o-ring to seal against. Before installing the oil pump back on the engine, I also changed this um, plastic valve that goes between the oil pump and the engine. It's called a pressure relief, but I think the main purpose of this valve is to stop oil from like flowing back into your pan when your engine is not running. And this valve had also gone really hard on this engine, that's why I was replacing it. And I think it's definitely a good idea to replace all these rubber parts when you have your engine apart, because most of the rubbers I found inside this engine, they were really hard. There's three Torx bolts that hold the oil pump to the engine block, and they need to be torqued down to 20 Newton meters. After that, there's a few smaller Torx bolts that go on the tube that hold the tube to the block and also to the pump itself. After the oil pump was installed, next I got to the timing cover. So I changed these to rubber o-rings that go at the back of the timing cover. These are what seals the main coolant lines that flow coolant to the block and they stop that coolant from going into the oil. So it's really important to replace these every time. And also change the front main seal. This is the seal that um, seals against the hydraulic damper. Usually you need to like put a large socket on it and tap it down with the hammer. But this one was easy enough to get in just by hand. So I just pushed it in by hand and I was just able to install it. Now for installing the timing cover, there's two really important diagrams to follow. One is this one that tells you, it's the bolt diagram for the timing cover. It tells you um, which bolt exactly goes where because all these bolts that go on the timing cover, they're actually different lengths. Uh, but what I like to do is when I was removing the engine, I already put these, all the bolts of each length into separate bags and I have them labeled like 7 or 8 or whatever the diagram says it is. And what I like to do is I like to also like write these numbers like right over here. This bolt says 7, this one says 7. And so then when I put this on, I'll actually know like I'll put, I'll take all the bolts out of the bag that's labeled 7. And then I'll know those, all those bolts go in these holes and then 8s go in whatever holes they go in. That makes it a lot easier to assemble everything when you're putting everything back together. The other diagram that's really important to follow is... Uh, the one for the sealant, that um, how to apply the gasket maker on the back of the timing cover. It's also important to avoid um, gasket maker on some of these places where, um, because these are oil pressure lines, and if you like apply gasket maker on these oil pressure lines, uh, the gasket maker can actually go into your oil pressure lines and like clog a hydraulic lifter or something else. So after that I just applied the gasket maker behind the timing cover. The thickness of the gasket maker should be 2 millimeters. Uh, so this picture will give you an idea of how much 2 millimeters is, you just need a thin strip of gasket maker. And once the gasket maker was applied, it was time to put the timing cover back on the engine. There's two alignment dowels that need to go into the timing cover first, and then once they're in, you can press the timing cover all the way back. 
After that I inserted all the bolts that hold the timing cover to the block. Now a few of the bolts just go directly into the timing cover, but for the other bolts, the water pump and also this um, bracket that holds one of the pulleys in place, that those need to go on first because the same bolts that hold the timing cover, they're also holding the water pump and this thing in place. So this bracket and the water pump needs to be installed first. For installing this bracket there's a um, gasket maker that needs to go be applied behind that. And also for a few of the bolts there's actually a gasket maker that uh, needs to be applied behind the bolts. The bolt diagram actually marks all those bolts that uh, need gasket maker behind the bolts. Next I installed this rubber gasket that seals the water pump to the timing cover and then next I installed the water pump. Now a few of the bolts that go into the water pump they're really long bolts that also like go directly into the blocks so they are what um, holds the timing cover to the block. Uh, so for those ones I installed those first because those ones are needed to be installed in order to like clamp the timing cover properly to the block and there's other smaller M6 bolts that are just for holding the water pump just to the timing cover and those also need to be installed later for like um, properly torquing down the uh, water pump to the timing cover. All the bolts that are holding the timing cover to the block they need to be torqued down to 20 newton meters and then for the smaller bolts that are holding the water pump just to the timing cover they need to be torqued to 14 newton meters. Also talking a bit about this issue where the oil pump chain touches against this um, part of the timing cover. That's one of the issues I talked about in a previous video but after looking into it this is something that pretty much happens on every M113 engine because this part does sit really close to the oil pump chain and when the oil pump chain just um, slacks around it hits this part and um, that's why it just um, scrapes this part away. The only change I made to this was I grinded a bit more of this um, part away. The purpose of this part is to prevent the timing chain from slipping on the timing chain sprocket in case the timing chain is to lose tension. I think the proper solution for this is to put a plastic guide or something on this place so the oil pump chain doesn't hit against the aluminum and doesn't like scrape it off. But yeah for now I just grinded down the surface just by a little bit to get it slightly farther away from the oil pump chain. And just to make it a little smoother too so that when the oil pump chain hits against it it doesn't get stuck against it or it doesn't um, get damaged or anything. Once the timing cover was done, next I had to get to installing this end cover. So the timing cover is what seals the front of the engine. This small cover is what seals the rear of the engine. And the rear main seal, the seal that seals the back side of your crankshaft actually goes on this cover. Uh, so it's important to change that seal before you can install this. Installing this cover is actually a pretty similar process to installing the timing cover. Just follow the sealant diagram and make sure to apply the sealant in the places that are specified. Talking a bit more about the sealant, it does need to be applied in 10 minutes according to the service manual. This is just so that it doesn't start going dry when it's time to actually put it on. But yeah, once the sealant was put on according to the diagram, it was time to put this cover on. I used that white plastic thing to guide the rear main seal onto the crankshaft because it's difficult to get that seal onto the crankshaft. And then I just tightened down all the bolts by hand. And after giving an hour for the gasket maker to harden just by a little bit, then I torqued these bolts to spec. The specification for this one is 10 newton meters, so all these bolts need to be torqued down to 10 newton meters. Now getting to installing the oil pans, for this one there's also two diagrams that you have to follow. There's one diagram that tells you how to apply the gasket maker and there's a bolt diagram. Now for the bolt diagram be careful because um, for the timing cover I also found that um, the diagrams did have a few mistakes on them. Like a few of the bolts were like the length that it mentioned the bolts should be, they were the wrong length actually. Um, so when you're disassembling the engine just make sure to keep track of which uh, where each bolt comes from. So when you're putting everything back together you can know that um, where each bolt goes. So what I've done for the oil pan now is that well these these bolts are labeled 1, 2, 3, and 4 and it tells you like bolt 1 is a 20 millimeter long bolt and bolt 2 is a 40 millimeter long bolt. That's how you know which ones they are. And I've put these in order so all these are the bolts that are 1 and all these are 2, all these are 3 and these are 4. Uh, so when I'm following the diagram and when I'm installing everything I'll know that all the ones that are 2 they go over here then 1's go over here and then the 3's go over here and the 4 goes over here. Um, there's even a mistake on this diagram because it says that there's 4's um, that go over here but actually on my oil pan um, these two bolts are actually covered like there's nothing that goes in here. So I only have two bolts that um, go on th those holes. I guess because these diagrams are like uh, generic diagrams they're made for like every different model but in reality some models um, have like slight changes to them like this one doesn't need bolts over here whereas some other models might need bolts over there so that's why these diagrams are slightly off. Just be careful of that when you're installing this. Also to quickly show you guys the oil pan design in this car when the upper and lower oil pan are together. Now before I was actually thinking of adding a few more baffles on this oil pan when the when it's apart. But now looking at the design there's not really that much need of any baffles. Uh, there's also this plate that goes um, in the middle of these two oil pans that's not in place right now so it goes um, somewhere over here but underneath the upper oil pan so it goes like in that part over here. And with that plate in place there's definitely not that much place the oil can go towards the side like it definitely can't go up and then like climb up somewhere because all of this is covered. 
Um, and also, like, the only place the oil can go to is under braking. The oil can move to the, like, pan at the front and also, like, uh, climb up the uh, timing cover because all this place is open. But then again, there's another collector that goes over here that sucks oil from this um, oil pan and then it throws oil back to this oil pan. So with that over there, I don't think there's any need for that either to, like, stop oil from going to the front oil pan because that oil would be thrown back towards this oil pan anyways. So yeah, for now, I'm not going to be making any changes to the oil pan in terms of, like, adding baffles or anything because there's definitely not even any place to add more baffles um, it's already a pretty good design but what I'm going to be working on is making a much better oil pressure monitoring system so that if in case uh, the car happens to lose oil pressure due to like too much cornering forces or anything else in the oil pressure system there would be a warning right away so I would know and then if I realize that uh, the oil pan needs a better system like it needs more baffles or maybe it's time to upgrade to a dry sump then that's something that I can consider for later uh, but for now yeah I'm just going to be putting it back together just like this. For installing the upper oil pan, yeah, it's still pretty much the same process to supply the sealant according to the sealant diagram. Now the only thing to be careful of uh, on this one is that some of the bolts go on the inside of the engine and the other bolts that secure the oil pan to the engine, they go on the outside of the engine. So for some of the bolts, the sealant needs to be applied on the inside of the holes and for other ones it needs to be applied on the outside of the holes. But the sealant diagram makes it pretty easy to follow anyway, so just follow the diagram and you'll get it right. And after that, once the sealant was applied, it was time to put the oil pan on the engine and then inserting all the bolts. And then the final torque specification for these bolts is 10 Newton meters. Just try to torque these bolts down in a start pattern so the gasket maker gets compressed evenly. And after that, it was just time to install this plate that goes between the upper oil pan and the lower oil pan. So this is as far as I'm going to get for this video. I've mounted the upper oil pan on. The lower oil pan is still off. The reason I'm going to leave it off for now is that uh, when I'm installing the heads, if I drop something in the timing cover or anything, at least right now the engine is open and I'll be able to take it out from the bottom. Uh, that's why I'm just going to leave the lower oil pan off until the end, until the heads and everything are mounted. And now with this plate in place, you can see that like the sump design is actually pretty good. So this is where the sump at the back goes and um, this is where the sump at the front goes. So you can see that there's baffles pretty much everywhere. There's no way for the oil to like splash around or go anywhere. That's why I didn't really make any changes to it. It's going to be hard to improve this design anyways. The only baffle I can think of adding is like something over here to stop the oil from going forwards under braking but again like I mentioned that's not gonna be a big issue anyways because there's another um, pump over here that's all it does is sucks oil from this sump and it throws it at the sump at the back again uh, so yeah even that's not gonna be a big problem I think the only things I don't like about this design is the strainer because the strainer is located inside the pump so for cleaning the strainer you'll have to disassemble everything again and like take this back thing off and then only you can clean the main strainer over here and the other thing is obviously the o-ring but hopefully with this new o-ring and everything it should seal up much better um, but yeah other than that in terms of at least um, like dealing with g-forces and everything i think this is a pretty good oil sump design so getting back to what i plan to do with the engine later well first off when the rebuild is complete i'll put this engine back in the e55 just to test everything so i won't be making any changes to the exhaust manifold or to the intake system initially because I just want to test the engine when it's like back together in as much of a stock form as possible just to make sure that the rebuild has gone fine and like all the values look normal but I'm not going to be tracking the E55 or anything because the last race of the season is September 16th so I definitely won't be able to put the E55 back together and like bring it to a stage where it can be tracked so I won't be trying for that but what that means is that I'll be left with an awful lot of time until next year, till the next um, racing season starts. So what I'm planning to do is build a better project for next year, like build a lighter, better car. Now the reason is not that I think the U55 is a bad car or anything, I just think that there's a lot more opportunity to uh, modify the engine and make the most out of this package. Like if I um, swap it into something else, like take the components from the U55 and bolt them into something else. So what I am planning to do is move the turbos to the front and possibly get rid of the supercharger because after weighing everything the supercharger weighs 40 kilograms. The rest of the system combined with the intercooler, the heat exchanger and all that, it weighs like close to 50 kilograms. So that's an awful lot of weight. Uh, so I think moving the turbos to the front and like moving with a different manifold, it will help me not only free up some more extra horsepower, it will also um, help save a lot of weight. So that's definitely going to be a big benefit. Talking about the next project, I'm still trying to scratch a design together. I haven't like exactly decided what it's going to look like and what it's going to be like. But whenever I do get everything decided, I'm definitely going to post possibly even a separate video on that topic. So you guys will definitely get to see that. But for now, I'll just try to get this um, engine rebuild finished so I can test it in the E55, make sure that everything is normal, and then I'll probably be moving to that project. But yeah, that's everything for this video. The next video is going to be about bolting the heads on the engine and like finishing the rest of the engine. So yeah, try to stay tuned for that one. And thanks for watching.